antes de comenzar, ya que seguro se lo saben de memoria, no traen unos avisos. Uno es, es, es sobre las cuestiones de seguridad, en caso de que suene una alarma o haya un terremoto o cualquier fenómeno este, que no podemos predecir. Ah, lo que tenemos que hacer es abandonar el auditorio de una forma ordenada, entonces tenemos dos áreas de emergencia, por donde entraron ustedes y esta otra, entonces en caso de cualquier emergencia hay que abandonar la vida del auditorio por allá y la otra mitad por acá de forma este, ordenada. Bueno, este, les voy a hablar un poco de los seminarios que vamos a tener la siguiente semana. Este, tenemos a Andrea Martínez Ballester, de aquí del este, Jardín Botánico, es una investigadora que fue contratada hace poco y va a hablar del dilema de la conservación. Ah, los retos que plantea el uso y manejo de los recursos naturales. Entonces, la siguiente semana, en 15 días, tenemos a Víctor Hugo Reynoso, aquí curador de la colección de anfibios y reptiles, que va a hablar algo de filogeografía, este, genes y, e iguanas. Después, a la siguiente semana, y antes de irnos a la ocasión, vamos a tener a Diego Cortés, que trabaja con lagartijas y va a hablar con aspectos de reproducción de, de estos animales. Y bueno, pues ahí tenemos eh, un seminario muy, muy interesante, este, cerca de abejas y orquídeas, y pues lo va a impartir a Philip Brand. Philip Brand es um, estudiante de doctorado en la Universidad de uh, UC Davis y viene visitando en estos momentos a Ismael Hinojosa, que es quien estudia este, este grupo de abejas aquí en el instituto. Y bueno, un poco de, de Philip. Philip estudió este, la licenciatura y la maestría en. A biología, en Evolutionary Biology, en la Univers Universidad de Düsseldorf, en, en Alemania. ¿no? Es alemán. Y para el doctorado, pues a, cambió de país y vino a, a, a América, y está en Estados Unidos, en la Universidad de UC Davis, y trabaja con un investigador que se llama Santiago Ramírez. Entonces, lo que nos va a presentar ahora, pues es parte de la investigación que estaba haciendo del proyecto doctoral. Y bueno, pues es, es bastante interesante, ¿no? Este, Philip Brandt tiene, este, tiene mucha experiencia con, con asuntos de genómica, con la evolución de los uh, quimioreceptores, uh, de las familias de los genes de los quimioreceptores, uh, y bueno, ha publicado, a pesar de que es muy joven, tiene externas este, publicaciones, muchas de ellas uh, muy, muy potentes, ¿no? Como en DNC Evolutionary Biology, bueno, tiene otras en Mitochondrial DNA, que es una revista también muy importante. Eh, bueno, Animal Behavior y bueno, lo que nos va a presentar ahora pues es prácticamente su proyecto al final tendremos tiempo para preguntas y si quieren preguntar de más pues tendremos la sesión de café y galletas uh, para que se acerquen a él y le pregunten directamente pues muchas gracias I did not really understand what you were saying, but I thought it was very nice. Um, I also want to thank Ismail for being a really great host for the last three weeks here, and for you, and you two for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of this very nice and interesting department. I had lots of very interesting um, discussions with a lot of people here, and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm really excited to share my Uh, thesis work with you. I'm currently in my third year, so quite in the middle of my thesis. So I'm really interested in discussing my results with you, and uh, I hope um, it makes sense for all of you. Um, okay. So the most important part in the life of sexually reproducing um, organisms is actually to identify, find, and detect suitable males, like in this example of the signal. Um, and a very effective way to do this is to use chemical signals. So we have a female moth here that produces a chemical signal in an internal gland that um, transfers information of the sex of the individual, it's a female, of the mating status she's ready to mate, and also the geographical location. And this chemical signal is really attractive to males of these species, which readily follow the signal in order to find a suitable mate. So these chemical signals that are used in sexual communications are usually referred to as sex pheromones. And just to remind everyone, pheromones are usually defined as chemical signals that are emitted by an individual of a certain species and that elicit a specific response in other conspecifics, so individuals of the same species. And sex hormones have certain pro uh, properties um, that are important to think about. They can either be single compounds, but 
also complex chemical mixtures. They are highly species specific and they are very important in reproductive isolation between sympatric species. Um, actually, sexual pheromones are used throughout the throughout organisms throughout the um, entire tree of life. It starts with single cell algae over fungi to invertebrates up to higher vertebrates. And actually, sex pheromones are uh, more frequently you know, more frequently used uh, than, for example, visual signals or um, acoustic signals in order to find suitable mates in nature. Um, um, Pheromone communication systems, like chemical communication systems, have um, defined properties. So they um, are made up of three different um, um, modules. We have a sender that produces a signal that is then detected by a receiver. So here, in our example of the moth, we have the female producing a pheromone that can be detected by the male. But in order for these communication systems to work, the signal emitted needs to be very specific in order for the male to be able to detect it and to integrate the information conferred by this pheromone. So a female that produces a signal that cannot be identified um, by the receiver has a lower fitness than uh, females that are able to produce the correct signal. And on the other hand, males that are not able to detect the signal the right way have a lower fitness, fitness than males that actually can do this. So these systems are thought to be under very strong reciprocal selective pressures and traditionally are thought to evolve under strong stabilizing selective pressures. So these systems are thought to be stable throughout generations. But the problem with this is, is then, if we look into nature and see this huge diversity of pheromone communication systems, this is in stark contrast to the stabilizing selection of these um, pheromone communication systems. So a big question that is still not resolved yet is, how do novel pheromone communication systems actually evolve? And this is the question that is at the core of my thesis and motivates my work. So, to, in order to think about how these parallel communication systems actually can evolve, we have to go a little bit deeper in how these um, um, signals are produced and received. So, we have the same production again in the moth example. A female produces a, a, a chemical signal in, with using biochemical pathways and specialized glands internally in, um, in her body. And then the signal gets received by the nose of the males, which is an insect specific, located on the antenna. So we have two distinct pathways. One, the biochemically producing the scent, and the other one, uh, needed to actually detect the scent. So in order for pheromone communication systems to evolve, in this classic sense, we need at least two mutations, right? We need one mutation in the producing part to change the signal, and then another mutation in the detection part to actually detect the signal. So it is a little bit different in the organisms I am working with in uh, the very charismatic organisms. Here, actually, males produce the pheromones, but they don't produce the pheromones in internal glands, but they collect chemical volatile signals from the environment. So they go to flowers or fungi and collect um, scents in order to produce the pheromone. So they need their sense of smell to detect the scent, right? And on the other side, the females that are attracted to the scents also need the sense of smell. So here we have a linkage in the olfactory system. Um, and this is very interesting. This linkage of male traits and female preference is because, in comparison to the moth example, we only need a single mutation theoretically to change the communication system, right? And this is what makes the octopi pheromone communication system so interesting because there's a potential for very rapid evolution in, um, for example, um, um, mechanisms like fishery and runaway. Yeah, and the molecular underpinnings of 
the evolution of this pheromone system is what I'm interested in. And in my, in my research, I'm working on three different parts to try and understand this uh, pheromone communication system. In my first part, I uh, work with the macroevolution of olfactory genes to understand how they evolve within orchid bees and other bees. In my second part, I'm um, investigating the potential role of olfactory genes in reproductive isolation, and it shows a population um, based approach to do this. And in the third part, I'm actually trying to bring the genotype to the phenotype and understand the function of interesting olfactory receptor genes. Yeah, so the orchid bees are located within the AP day in the bees, and they are um, uh, located in a monophyletic group together with the honeybees the stingless bees, the Bellicolini, and the bumblebees. But unlike these other three tribes, orchid bees are only distributed throughout the neotropics. They are solitary, this means they don't have new social structures like honeybees, for example. And then there's this very interesting fragrance collecting behavior that we can observe in males of all orchid bee species known so far. And these are more than 200 species. So males throughout their entire life co collect uh, volatile chemical substances, as you can see here in the Los Angeles, the males are collecting uh, a scent called Sineola at the moment, and they store these um, chemicals in especially adapted pouches on their hind tibia. And here you can see they cut through such a tibia, it is filled with a spongy tissue that is especially adapted to retain these chemicals. So over the entire lifespan of such a male, um, a complex chemical blend accumulates that we call the perfume. So this perfume is eventually released in a very stereotypic manner. So all species show very similar behavior there. And here on the left side, you can see a Euglossa flamia individual uh, doing such perfume display. And it would sit on a perching tree and engage in short hover flights. And during these hovering flights, it releases the perfume. And as you can see, it is um, doing um, very fast leg movements here. And these fast leg movements is um, needed for the bee to actually take the perfume from the hind leg and transport it under the wing in order to spray this perfume. So on the right side, the video is in slow motion where you can see this leg movement a little bit better. The perfume is taken from the left hind leg using the right hind leg right now, and then from the right hind leg to the middle leg of the right side, which is then now taken under the wing, where it is then sprayed, where the perfume is then sprayed. And this happens downwind in order to attract females of the same species. Yeah, this very intriguing and cool natural history um, is the reason why we actually know a lot about perfume phenotypes because throughout the last 25 years a lot of people were really interested in the chemical ecology of orchid bees. So in this, speed, in this, uh, in this uh, publication which was published in 2009 by Yvonne Zimmerman and her colleagues, um, they looked into the perfume phenotypes of about 15 species on Barro Colorado Island in Panama. And here in this heat map, you can see single um, chemical compounds in the rows and single species in the columns. And a black color means a high relative abundance of a chemical in the perfume of the species, and a white color means that it is not present. And just from eyeballing this um, heat map, you see that the perfumes are actually quite different between species. And if we have a deeper look, I want to show you one example of Euglossa cognata and Euglossa mixta, two orchid bee species that are morphologically extremely similar, and only specialists like Ismail are able actually to uh, find out which uh, species they are morphologically. But if we have a look at the perfume, like in the stand here, here you can see the relative abundance of about 30 chemicals uh, in the perfumes of both species, and gray is Euglossa cognata and black Euglossa mixta. What you see is that there's a difference in the relative abundance of uh, chemicals between the two species, but also presence and absence. So we have a qualitative and quantitative difference 
in uh, protein phenotypes that you can see whenever you compare two species. So today we know that these perfumes of orchid bees are actually extremely species specific. They are evolving under divergent selection and they are, ex they are very important species recognition signals. So if you take a perfume from a male and present it, only conspecific individuals are attracted to it. Um, yeah, this is actually where um, my fascination about this whole system starts because I'm interested in what are the molecular reasons and underpinnings for the differences in these pheromone communication systems, the perfect communication systems we see. And I want to talk very briefly about an example of two very closely related sibling species, Diglossa dilemma and Diglossa viridissima, which are about 150,000 years diverged only, so they're very young species. And this here is a so-called NMDS plot, an individual scaling plot, where single dots represents the perfume phenotype, the chemical um, phenotype of an individual, and two, the more closely, uh, closely together these dots are, the more similar the perfumes are. And you also need is in white, and you also read the uh, in black, and what you can see is that they cluster very nicely. And uh, the biggest difference between the perfumes of these two species is actually a single chemical compound, which is called HNDB, which is short for this very complicated term here. And um, so a question Thomas Ayers and his colleagues had is, um, is there actually a difference in the capability of smelling HNDB between the two species? species? And could that play a role in how the pheromone perfume um, is collected? So what they did is they had a look at the antenna, the nose of the insects, to see um, the response of the whole antenna to this chemical. And um, HND, they, they used two different stereoisomers of HNDB, and you can see that the antenna of Euglossa dilemma in white individuals responds significantly higher than the antenna of Euglossa iridisma individuals. And um, as a comparison, 2 undecanone is a chemical that is present in both species perfumes, and you see no difference between the antenna response. So this suggests that actually the antenna periphery, where the chemical information is translated into, into an ecophysiological information, plays a role in um, the detectability, the olfactory capability of the species. And um, I want to briefly talk about this olfactory periphery because it's important um, for what I'm doing. So the, the place where the external chemical information is translated into electrophysiological information is actually in the so-called olfactory sensilla that are located on the antenna of um, insects. They are coated by cuticula, which has pores in order for chemicals to get in, it is filled with an aqueous sensible lymph, and the bath in this limb are the dendrites of so-called olfactory sensible neurons. And the membrane of these neurons is actually the place where the chemical information is translated into electrophysiological information. So the way this works is um, we have orders that have to um, protrude the um, sensible and somehow get to the membrane. The problem is that these chemicals are hydrophobic. So um, there exists a class of genes, the so-called odorant carrier proteins, that bind these chemicals um, at the pores and transport them to the membranes of the olfactory sensible neurons where they release them. Because situated in the membrane of these neurons are olfactory receptors that bind those chemicals as ligands and at the same time are um, channels, so they are ionotropic receptors. These channels open, and um, an action potential force that is then transported to the antenna lobe and higher centers of the insect brain. And there are five interesting gene families that have tens to hundreds of copies in a single genome of an insect. Um, and I'm working with all of these families, but today I will only talk about the um, odorant receptors, which is the biggest and most important olfactory receptor family in insects. So in order to um, get to the answer of this question, I am looking into the molecular properties of bee species 
in order to get an idea of how this huge diversity of perfume phenotypes evolved. And in my first part, I am looking at the macro evolutionary patterns of olfactory genes, and therefore my main question is actually um, what the molecular mechanisms um, are under which these chemosensory genes evolve in olfactories. And therefore, I'm looking at the evolutionary dynamics of the gene families, I'm looking at selective pressures that might drive the evolution of these families, and also at the genomic architecture because we have genome data available for this. But today I will only talk about the first two parts because of the time constraints. So the way I'm working is um, I have to, I cannot do genomics with these bees because the genomes are really big, one to four gigabases, and to sequence uh, many big genomes requires a lot of money and time, we don't have that. So what I'm doing is um, a targeted transcriptome approach. I'm uh, collecting pairs of St. Patrick or 50 species of different divergence kinds, and I collect the antenna of males, which I then extract RNA from, sequence them on this, do a standard Illumina sequencing, and then, um, sorry, then a bunch of bioinformatics in order to make sense of this uh, huge amount of data. My current data set for the overall receptors includes Six orchidies, uh, seven orchidies species from three different genera. There are five genera, so um, we get a good idea about the evolution in orchidies with this data set. The Glossodilemma biridissima are uh, here again, the species I have talked about multiple times already. The Glossophobia and Imperialis, um, they are from Costa Rica, and the Ulema boniformis and the Ulema Mexicana. And then Euphrisia mexicana is a little bit different from this data set because the genome was published last year and I just decided to uh, take the um, information from this genome in my data set. So, in total, most of these data sets are of transcriptomic origin, but uh, for Euglossa Dilemma, we actually sequenced the genome and I assembled and annotated it, so it's very nice that we have both types of data. And for your, for your physio, Mexicana, we only have the genomic data. So in total, I could annotate over 800 olfactory receptors in these seven species, of which almost 700 are available in full length. And these are the only ones I use for the subsequent analysis. So what I do is um, I, I construct gene trees. And this is very messy data because you have a lot of parallax. And um, what I'm trying to do is figure out which are actually orthologs there. I'm trying to make a little bit sense of this data in defining uh, subplanes or subfamilies. And I could define 26 of those. And these subplanes very nicely correspond to um, a very conserved genomic architecture. So all the genes of one species that are part of a subplane, for example, here, subplane Y, are actually located in, the, in a homologous area of the genome. And this is true for all of the three OTP um, genera I have um, included in the data set, but also for uh, the honeybee, bumblebees, and stingless bees. So these are conserved for over 18 million years of bee um, evolution, which is quite interesting. But what I really am interested about is to look at the patterns of selection. So what I'm doing here is I'm using standard DNDS analyses, um, just to remind everyone, the n is the number of non-synonymous substitutions per non-synonymous sites in a gene, and ds is the number of synonymous substitutions per synonymous site. Um, and when the n and ds are similar, uh, this ratio is 1, and the gene is thought to evolve under neutral evolution. This often happens, for example, in pseudogenes that have no selective pressures acting anymore. Then if the DNDS value is smaller than one, genes are thought to involve a purifying selection. And most of the genes actually have a DNDS of smaller than one if you compare, uh, for example, primate and human genomes with each other. Um, and the interesting genes for me are those that have a DNDS bigger than one because they're supposedly evolving under positive selection. Um, so um, last year, 
I put out this um, article about Yugoslav dilemma and Yugoslav iridissima, where I did a pairwise comparison of the chemosensory um, genes that I found, um, 94 chemosensory genes, and I compared the DNDS values of, the, of this group with more than 3,000 genes that are not involved in chemosensation. And uh, what I could show is that DS is actually quite similar between these group, groups, but uh, DN is significantly elevated in chemosensory genes. And this um, suggests that chemosensory genes in orchid bees are evolving rapidly. And here in panel B, I plotted DS against DN for all of those over 3,000 genes. Um, where the diagonal line is at the NDS of one, mutual evolution, the upper corner here um, harbors genes that have the NDS smaller than one, so they are the um, negative purifying selection, and this group here of genes is supposedly evolving on a positive selection. And what you can see here, I plotted over 3,000 genes, but you only see a couple of dots here, and the reason is that most genes have no differences between these two species, they are very similar. So these genes are all situated at the zero zero coordinate here. Um, so what is very interesting for me is that the genes here in the region where um, genes are located that are in positive selection are significantly enriched for chemosensory genes, namely odorant receptors and ionotropic receptors and another class of olfactory receptors. And I want to point out this one receptor here, OR41. It has a DNDS value of 7 which is incredibly high. So this suggests that this gene evolves under an extremely strong divergent selection between your loss of dilemma and your loss of your um, Yeah, we'll talk about this a little later. So and after I, I finished this study, one question that we raised was, is this actually a common pattern in orchid bees, what I detected, the, the selective pressures? So um, I analyzed this uh, big data set with Three, uh, with seven orchid species, including three other species of bees. Um, and now with, with this big data set, I can actually use methods that have way more power um, to analyze the uh, selective pressures. And the stars indicate the odor receptors under positive selection um, and are color-coded um, like the species, and all but one species have odor receptors that evolve under positive selection. So it seems that this kind of pattern that I, I was observing when comparing the two sibling species, the Lema viridissima, are actually common in orchid bees. Uh, and the way I do this, um, just very briefly, is um, I do not take the whole tree because it is way too big and you would uh, see it almost no signal, but I uh, define orthologous groups that have copies of at least four of these species here. And uh, I could analyze 144 of all the groups for um, selection. Ah, uh, yeah, we have our candidate OR41 um, also popping out in this analysis here. So, to conclude this first part, um, what I can say about orchid the chemosensory gene evolution is that the chemosensory genes actually evolve quite rapidly, and um, divergent selection or positive selection. Um, seems to be a common pattern observable in orchid bees, and also, by the way, in other bees, because I also detected some in the other three bees that I am not talking about today. Um, it, this is very, very good for candidate gene detection for um, subsequent projects that we are working on right now. And um, from this pairwise um, comparison, I could see that all receptors and ionotropic receptors but no other of these gene families show these um, divergence like patterns. So this suggests a possible impact of chemosensory receptors on odor perception in orchid bees, and in this way it might actually play a role in determining perfume phenotypes. Yeah, in my second part, part um, the second part is actually the reason why I'm here. Um, I'm performing a population genetic study on Euglossa dilemma and Euglossa viridissima. And um, Ismail is helping me in the field and uh, a lot with um, questions about OPG taxonomy and morphological identifications. Um, yeah, so what drives my interest here <coughs> is uh, are the questions of how, of whether chemosensory genes actually show
show higher levels of interspecific and compared to intraspecific differentiation, then whether divergent imperfect phenotypes is actually correlated with divergence they see on the molecular level or in these uh, chemosensory genes. And um, another very intriguing question is whether divergence is stronger in sympatric as compared to allopatric populations of these two species. And um, Dugosa Dilemma and Dugosa Decima are extremely suitable to answer these questions or to ask these questions so far um, because they have a very nice parapatric distribution from southern Mexico down to northern Costa Rica, where you will see very decent here in light green, is L. Patrick in the Mexican, in the northern Mexican part, and you will also dilemma is L. Patrick in the southern part of the range, and both co occur in this part of uh, south, southeastern Mexico, northern Guatemala, and the east. Um, so, I went, uh, ah yeah, also we have one Yugosa dilemma population that was introduced in Florida about 15 years ago. Um, and what I'm actually doing with, with all these males is, is are three different types of, oh no, sorry, that's later. So yeah, Yugosa dilemma, Yugosa bridissima males all look like this. They're extremely similar and the only way to differentiate those two species is actually by looking at the mandibles. So the glossa dilemma always has uh, three teeth in the mandible, and the glossa dilemma has either three or two. But the, three, the, the difference between the three teeth individuals is that the middle tooth in the glossa dilemma is equidistant from the other two, and the middle tooth in the glossa gradissima males is closer to the third one. This is, these are the differences, and it's extremely hard to um, do these identifications in the field, and Ismail actually found out that there are males that are some, somewhat intermediate between the and Viridisima, especially in the parts where parapatric and sympatric areas meet, which is very interesting because there might actually be uh, hybrids that are very, very valuable for my analyses. Again, I want to show you this NMDS plot, this, uh, this time in three dimensions, uh, where again, you will see the individuals cluster very nicely, and also you will see the individuals. And those very decimal individuals with three teeth highlighted in red are very nicely clustered within dilemma. So the perfumes are distinct between these two species. Yeah, so my lab mates always told, tell me I have to show pictures of myself working in the field because everybody likes these pictures. So I'm introducing one here. You, you, it might be actually hard to see me in this picture because I'm hidden right <laughs> under this hurricane. Um, Ricardo Ayala and I had actually to uh, be evacuated from the Chavala field station last year when Hurricane Patricia hit Jalisco. Uh, so it was quite exciting. But I got my bees, so everything is fine. Um, and the same thing, so here in circles um, are the places where we already sampled, and the triangles have to be sampled still. As you can see, we have sampled a lot of different populations um, all over the, the range and only Guatemala and um, Honduras are left yet and I will do this this summer so I'll hopefully be done with the collection by the end of this year. So yeah, I use these, all these individuals I collect for three different types of analyses. First I do um, what is called genotyping by sequencing. This is a reduced representation uh, approach, where, which is very similar to RegTag sequencing. So I'm sequencing the genome randomly in hundreds of individuals of the two species at the same um, sites. And um, this gives me an idea later of the, popul the mutual population dynamics of these uh, two species. And then also I do targeted resequencing of order of receptors that seem to be extremely divergent between the two species and also controls in order to figure out what is actually going on there on a population genetic level. Also, I'm analyzing the perfume phenotypes of each individual that I'm capturing in the field. So yeah, GPS is, in is interesting for population history inf inference and And this is 
is very important to make sense of the chemosense brain gene evolution um, because it is interesting to see if they evolve similarly or uh, in a different way. And also the pheromone divergence will be very interesting to see if we have correlations between chemosensory receptors and the perfume pheromone phenotype section. So the data I'm showing you now is uh, GBS data of over 180 individuals uh, collected in five different places. Um, and I got this data about a month ago, so it's preliminary and I'm very interested in talking about these results to you in order to make a little bit more sense of it. And so my data set has Eugolosa very decent populations here in um, this, the squares and dilemma in circles. And I included the population from Nayarit, um, which is allopathic for Viridissima, and Costa Rica and Florida are allopathic for Dilemma, whereas Florida is a little bit special, but it's still interesting. And then I have two places where at the exact same sites I collected Dilemma and Viridissima. So what I'm showing you now is the uh, principal component analysis of more than 5,000 SNPs that I could um, identify using the GBS approach. And here, each point um, represents an individual, and the closer two points are, the more similar two individuals are on the genetic level. And uh, this looks pretty messy, so I, I will try to make a little bit more sense here. So I have to highlight three different kind of clusters, and you're probably asking yourself, three clusters in two species, that's weird, and it's exactly what my reaction was, I was not expecting this. And what we have here is one very nice cluster for Euglossa veridissima, but two different for Euglossa dilemma. And let's have a look at these populations. So for Euglossa veridissima, we have a very interesting um, uh, geographical gradient from the west in Nayarit over Jalapa to Yucatan. This suggests there's isolation by distance. All of everything makes, makes sense, it's really nice. However, if we look into Euglossa dilemma, we have two different clusters, and it looks like the genomic divergence within Euglossa dilemma is higher or as high as the divergence between Euridissima and dilemma, which is quite uh, unexpected. So we have one cluster of individuals of the sympatric area, and the second cluster that has individuals of the allopatric areas. And um, interestingly, we see that the Florida population is close to the Costa Rican population, so it is very likely that trade between Costa Rica and the U.S. Um, is the reason for why we have Euglossa dilemma now in Florida, which is very nice for me to work because I don't need to collect the permits or anything. Um, yeah, so um, these population dynamics are quite puzzling, and my next steps are now to include more individuals and more populations, especially populations uh, from the areas of contact between allopatric and sympatric populations in order to try to make more sense of it. So, um, however, what I also did is I sequenced OR41 for individuals of each of these populations. Just to remember you, OR41 is this incredibly divergent um, receptor that has a DNA of 7 when you compare the dilemma and viridisma from the same place in the with each other. And very interestingly, the phylogeny, the gene tree of OR41, follows what we think the species are quite nicely. So, you go to your decent individuals share the same allele all over the range, all the way from Nayarit to Yucatan. Um, and um, are quite distinct from the glossa dilemma. And actually, actually, this analysis allowed me to figure out that OR41 is under positive selection. Here, this is the omega value with another program, so it's under positive selection in the glossa dilemma. Um, so something is happening actually in the glossa dilemma, not in the glossa dilemma. But here again, we have two alleles for the glossa dilemma. One allele for the allopatric populations, and one for the sympatric populations. And if, if you want to think in terms of FST, we have in this gene, we have an FST of 1 between the species and an FST of 1 within the species. So that is very interesting, and I really like to think about um, the difference between sympatric and allopatric populations in Dilemma as uh, maybe important for 
uh, species variants, maybe there was some sort of um, molecular reinforcement going on. And it's something that I find really exciting and I'm trying to go after. So I also sequenced, by the way, some individuals from Nicaragua, Honduras, and Tapachula that we still had in the lab. And all of those have the allopatric um, allele. So it seems to hold true, actually. Yeah, so the pre preliminary conclusions of this part is that we have a rather complex population structure that um, we still have to kind of make sense of. Um, however, um, the dilemma of population structure seems to correlate with sympatric allopatric species boundaries, which is interesting, but I am not sure what to make, uh, how to make sense of that right now. Um, but very interestingly, the OR41 phylogeny corresponds to the perfume phenotypes and also our species hypothesis quite nicely. And there also we have the sympatric allopatric difference in uh, this receptor. So yeah, what I told you, I will do now more comprehensive sampling, more populations, and also look at more chromosomes regions to get a better picture of what is going. And yeah, I will very briefly talk about the third part because um, it is the least developed of my thesis, but I think it is really exciting. And um, the major question there is actually to figure out the function of receptors that are under divergent selection. So what I'm doing now is trying to figure out the function of the three different OR41 alleles and to see if they have the same, fun the same function, do they detect the same chemicals, what are the differences between those alleles. So for that, we have to think a little bit about uh, um, potential functional consequences in olfactory receptors if they are mutated. And uh, what we have here is uh, some sort of uh, cartoon of the response of a receptor to chemicals in some sort of odor space. For example, all the chemicals floating around in the air in the forest of um, Tapachula. So um, what happens now if we have a non-synonymous mutation in this receptor, meaning a change of an amino acid in the receptor. So first what can happen is nothing. It's no difference. It's, it does not change the function at all. However, what can happen is actually that the receptor has a completely different function after mutation than before. And this is something that could be shown in moths, where a single mutation is enough for a receptor to actually bind a different chemical than was uh, bound before which is a quite, quite nice paper published in 2012 in PNAS, and you all should read it. And what also could happen is that the receptor is actually more specific afterwards. So it detects less chemicals, so, but also there could be um, a generalization after what's happened. So in order to figure out whether these scenarios um, happen in these oral receptors, in um, bees, I actually take the receptors and put them in the flies. Um, so I'm using the so-called empty urine system of uh, Drosophila, where I clone the bee receptor into flies, and this receptor is then expressed in an olfactory sensilla neuron that does not express a fly receptor anymore. So I can then go to the sensillum that expresses the B receptor and do neurophysiological analysis with it. Um, so I measure the currents that happen in this sensillum when I apply different chemicals to it. And what you see um, when you measure this is, uh, this here is uh, the background firing rate, so a spontaneous firing rate that every receptor and every uh, these neutrons neurons have, but when you apply a chemical that a receptor can bind to, you see a stark, stark increase in these chemicals. So this is just an example of a moth, but uh, just a few weeks ago I could uh, do the first analysis with the OR41 allele of dilemma from um, Yucatan, from the St. Patrick rate, and this is very preliminary. But what you can see here hopefully is when I apply the perfume of the dilemma, I have an increase in the firing rate of the neurons where I have expressed the B receptor. So this suggests actually that this OR41, which pops up in all of my analyses, has something to do 
with the perfume collection. So it's super exciting, but I have to do a lot of work um, there still. And this is our neurophysiological station, which is really interesting for me because I'm a, a yeah evolutionary biologist, a biomechanician. This is uh, quite exciting actually to play around with these things. And I would have never thought that I would work with some, something as boring as the plant model organism, but I'm actually doing a lot of uh, crossings right now. So, um, just to conclude my work so far, um, I could show that we have lineage specific divergence selection on chemosensory genes in different orchid bees from different genera. So, this seems to be a general pattern for orchid bees. Then um, it seems that high division or our evolution corresponds to our species hypothesis in Dilemma and Viridissima and also to the perfume phenotype we, we observe, although we have quite complex population structure. And um, all of these results I presented today, I think, um, lead into the direction that chemosensory gene family evolution might actually be involved in the evolution of the perfume phenotype in orchid bees. Yeah, so um, just to sum it up, my, the first and the second part of my uh, work are informative for my third part. And I hope that all of these three parts together will allow me to understand better the molecular evolutionary mechanisms of novel perfume communication systems in orchid bees. And now I have to thank a lot of people that helped me a lot with all the things that I'm not used to do. I want to point out again, Ismail for being such a nice host and for collecting in the field. Also, Ricardo Ayala when collecting with me. And I want to thank Easy Maxis for funding to come here. And I want to thank you for your attention.
hope in half a year or so I can have a look at the perfumes and see actually if they are different between our Patrick and uh, St. Patrick populations in this big data that I have. Done. And I think then we can talk about species. How long time that watch has been? Can you repeat that? How long did they live? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, so in the last females lived about four to six months, and males about three months. So they have and they have the exceptionally long lifespan for insects.
it's a good idea. Um, but um, do you figure out the difference between species? Maybe something about open adaptation. Because you said that you, you, you can symbolize this isolationalism. Yeah. But maybe, maybe if you try to find, if you try to find out if that really is original distance, or there is a lot of ecological conditions mm -hmm. that are involved no? yeah. in, the, in this, especially because they took these from plants from say, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I don't know if um, it makes sense to look at it thinking about the perfumes because we know that they are pretty good at producing a, a species specific perfume no matter where they are. So in Yucatan or in um, Santa Rosa in Costa Rica, which are quite different, they produce the same perfumes. But then we, um, what we observe sometimes is that males tend to be smaller in Yucatan, for example, of both species, but they're bigger and more animals because of really small examples big. And yeah, there might be some adaptation to um, maybe weather conditions because when it's is colder, maybe there's some selection to be bigger there yeah. or something like that. Especially those components that can be easy to uh, or maybe can be Thank you.